Cray. Grace. 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 All right. So, uh, as I had said, uh, tonight is through the Bible. We're not going to cover 26 through 31 like I originally had said in my, uh, um, in the emails I sent out, but we're going to do to 29 tonight. So, uh, starting in chapter 26, verse 1, it says, Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, David is hiding on the hill at Hekalah, opposite of Jeshimon. So Saul, accompanied by 3,000 of the choice men of Israel, went to the wilderness of Ziph to search out, uh, to search for David there. Saul camped beside the road at, at the hill of, um, Hikalah, opposite of Jeshimon. David was living the wilderness and discovered Saul had come there after him. So David sent out spies and knew for certain that Saul had indeed come. Immediately, David went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw the place where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the general of his army, had laid down. Saul was laying down inside the inner circle of the camp with the troops camped around him. Then David asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Joab, Joab's brother Abishah, son of Zeruah, who will, go, who will go with me into the camp of Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. That uh, that night, David, had, David and Abishai came to, uh, to the troops, and Saul was lying there asleep in the inner circle of the camp with a spear stuck to the ground by his head. Abner of the tree of of the troops were lying uh, were lying around him. Then Abishai said to David, "Today God has handed your enemy over to you. Let me thrust the spear through him into the ground just once. I will not have to strike him twice." But David said to Abishai. Don't destroy him, for who can lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and remain blameless? David added, As the Lord lives, the Lord will certainly strike him down. Either his day will come, or he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. However, because of the Lord, I will not never lift up my hand against the Lord's anointed. Instead, take the spear and the water jug that is by his head, and let us go. So David took the spear and the water jug by Saul's head, and they went their way. No one saw them, no one knew, for and no one woke up. And they all remained asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord came over them. And David crossed into the other side and stood up on the mountain at a distance. And there was a considerable spa space between them. Then David shouted to the troops and Abner, son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer, Abner? Who are you who calls the king? Abner asked. David said to Abner, you're a man, aren't you? Who in Israel is your equal? So why don't you protect your lord the king when one of his people came to destroy him? What, have, what you have done is not good. As the lord lives, all of you deserve to die since you didn't protect your lord, the lord's anointed. Now look around. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were by his head? Saul recognized David's voice and asked, Is that your voice, my son David? It is my voice, my lord uh, and king, David said. Then he continued, Why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? What evil is in my hand? Now may my Lord, the king, please hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. But if it is, a, but if it is people, may they be cursed in the presence of the Lord, for today they have driven me away from shearing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go and worship other gods. Now, let me go ahead and interject something right there. Um, they didn't actually tell him, go and worship other gods. But in Israel, it was tantamount. If you were driving someone away from the presence of the Lord and from the inheritance of the Lord, it was as if you were telling them, you're no longer welcome among, among God's people or with God. You're going to have to find another God and go worship them. Um, and that's essentially what was being said. So in verse 20, I mean, not, no one was actually saying it, but that was, that's the end game for what winds up happening if someone was exiled from Israel and David was being exiled. So in verse 20 says, so don't let my blood fall to the ground far from the Lord's presence for the king of Israel has come out to search for a flea like one who pursues um, a partridge in the mountains. 
Saul responded, I have sinned. Come back, my son David. I will never harm you again, because today you considered my life precious. I have been a fool. I have committed a grave error. David answered, Here's the king's spear. Have one of your young men come over here and get it. May the Lord repay every, repay every man for his righteousness and his loyalty. I wasn't willing to lift my hand against the Lord's anointed, even though the Lord handed you over to me today. Just as I considered your life valuable today, so may the Lord consider my life valuable and rescue, rescue me from all trouble. Saul said to him, You are blessed, my son David. You will certainly do great things and will prevail. Then David went on his way and Saul returned home. So there's another exchange of this ongoing pursuit of Saul against David that was irrational to the, the um, logical mind, but there was no rational uh, rationality to it. Uh, Saul's common sense had l long departed him. He was, we learned one of the very first sins of Saul was that he was more concerned about what man thought about him than he was about what God thought about him. And remember, we, we quoted from the book of Proverbs where it says that the fear of man brings a snare. And that's exactly what happened with Saul. And, uh, of course, he became, became uh, bitter in his heart and jealous against David and his success, uh, particularly when songs were written, uh, um, uh, singing David's praise higher than Saul's in that, you know, he had slayed more people and they recognized it in the song. Those kind of things um, irritated the jealousy that was within him and aggravated the hold that the spirit, the evil spirit that uh, was given him from the Lord, how that uh, that spirit had a, a grip on him. It was made worse and intensified by him yielding him more and more and more to evil. And this is what happens. The more we yield to evil, the more the grip it has on us. Uh, you, if you, if you begin to fall in an area of sin that maybe you've, you overcame years ago, but then you find yourself tripping up in the same area that you thought you'd overcome and you fall and you fall and you fall, you know, it doesn't take too long before that thing's grip is, uh, that thing's got a hold on you and it's as if you had never overcome it. Uh, because just, it just takes a little bit. And that's why the Bible says it's a little foxes that spoil the vine and a little leaven leavens a whole lump. It doesn't take much. So we have to, which is why the Bible says, be on guard and watchful. And we're not of those people who don't know the devil and his tactics, but we stand in guard against him and we don't give him any opportunity. And uh, Saul was giving him tons of opportunities. Now, um, uh, we're going on chapter 27. This is, uh, this um, chapter is really, I call it David's Ishmael because this whole time has been a time of testing and proving for David, which is, of course, uh, great timing on God's part, again, because we've been talking about that on Sundays. And I didn't in any way line this up. It just happened the way it happened. But uh, um, this whole time of Saul pursuing him uh, was a time of testing and proving for David, proving of his character. And this next chapter, chapter 27, shows that there was a lot of refinement that was necessary in David's character. David uh, uh, took it upon himself to become his own savior. He did not trust God, even though God had time and again, countless times, delivered him from the hand of Saul. Um, uh, David took his own protection into his own hands and sold himself into the hands of the enemy. And this is something that we do as well. It may seem like we read these stories and we're like, well, I don't know how that applies to me, but I got news for you. It it applies. Uh, any time that you protect yourself, any time that you put up walls and guards to defend your own heart rather than God defending it, I'm not talking about guarding your heart from evil. I'm talking about guarding your heart and protecting it against um, attacks and against... Uh, um, relationships and against uh, trust and things like that. When you do that, you, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Um, it's the complete opposite. It's the antithesis of trust. So we're picking up in verse 1 in chapter 27. It says, David said to himself, one of these days I will be swept away by Saul. This is as, he, as he's leaving that discussion he just had with Saul 
and God had just delivered him, as he's walking away, he says to himself, one of these days, that guy's going to get the best of me. You know, I mean, I, yeah, sure, I've, I've, I've done well up to this point, but eventually, you know, he's persistent enough that he's going to get me. That's essentially what David's saying here. One of these days, I'll be swept away by Saul. There's nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will stop searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I will escape from him. So here David is taking matters into his own hands. He's protecting himself, he's becoming his own provision and his own wall of safety, and it causes problems. And another sub-lesson in this is that when you're in a position of authority, that position of authority affects everybody underneath you. Period. It doesn't matter whether or not they deserved it or not. That's not the issue. The issue is they were underneath you. And David had 600 plus men who were underneath him. And his sin here caused a problem for all of his men. And uh, uh, it could have gotten a whole lot worse than it did. God was stepping in and protecting him. But, uh, you know, this is the way it works. And uh, so... You know, it's just like, you know, uh, God will place everybody, every child is placed into a home by the providence of God. God's the one that did that. Um, what winds up happening, as far as how well the parents are a parent, whether a good or a bad parent, God doesn't control that. But, and whatever happens, whatever decisions that child, that parent makes, affects the child, whether the child has done good or evil. It doesn't change that there are implications for the children in the same way that there's implications for a nation underneath a president or for um, a church under a pastor or, uh, you know, a wife under a husband, uh, employees under employer. All of those carry ramifications. And one thing that we will see consistently throughout Scripture is God is never in a hurry to take away authority that he has given. If he's given it, He's given it. And if you use it poorly, are people going to suffer? Yeah. But that doesn't mean he's going to stop it, at least not right away. So um, starting on back up in verse 2, chapter 27. So David acted on his impulse. He set out with his 600 men and went to Achish, son of Moak, the king of Gath. David and his men stayed with Achish in Gath. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives, um, Ahinoab and of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. When it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. So, hey, you know, David's plan worked, but it was still David's plan. He didn't consult with God. He didn't ask him. He was his own protection. Verse 5, it says, Now David said to Achish, if I have found favor with you, let me be given a place in one of your outlying towns so I can live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? That day Achish give, gave Ziklag to him, and it still belongs to the kings of Judah to this day. The time of David, the time that David stayed in the Philistine territory amounted to a year and four months. David and his men went up and raided the Girgashites and the um, Gerzites and the Amalekites. From ancient times, they had been the inhabitants of the region through Seir, Sir, as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he did not leave a single person alive, neither man or woman, but he took the flocks, herds, donkeys, camels, and... Uh, um, verse 9, when David attacked the land, he did not leave a single person alive, neither man nor woman, but he took flocks, herds, donkeys, camels, and clothing. Then he came back to Achish, who inquired, where did you raid today? David replied, the south, south country of Judah, the south country of um, Jeremelites, or against the south country of the Kenites. David did not let a man, woman, uh, man or woman live to be brought to Gath, for he said, or they will inform on us and say, this is what David did. This was David's custom during the whole time that he stayed in the Philistine territory. So Achish trusted David, thinking, since he has made himself detestable to his people Israel, he may be my servant forever. Now, obviously what was David doing here was he was lying to the king. 
And it was an outright lie. Now, there are some commentators that will say, well, he really kind of didn't really lie. It's some kind of more of a, of a, a peripheral of the truth. No, I'm sorry. It's a lie. Uh, yeah, these areas that he hit, uh, that he did attack, were on the outskirts of these other countries that did belong to Israel. But when he came back to his king, he made it sound like he's been fighting against the Israelites, his own people. And the reason why he did this was because he wanted to gain favor with this king. Um, and, and, and causing this king to think, hey, you know what? If he's willing to kill his own people from me and my people, he's truly now one of us. I can trust him. And so this is why David, when he went and he attacked these other areas, he didn't leave anybody live, living. He killed these people to cover up his lie. Countless thousands of people died because David wanted to protect himself and the 600 who were with him and their families. And so he did these things, killing countless of people and lied to the king, saying that the people he was attacking were Israelites. Um, again, the apple never falls too far from the tree. We've seen this problem ever since Abraham and then with Isaac, and then with Jacob, and every major person, for the most part, except for with Moses, um, we see this with everybody. They all, they lie and they deceive like crazy, and it's all to protect themselves. And so, uh, I mean, you remember with uh, when Abram protected himself when he traveled to this, that one king's area and claimed that uh, uh, Sarah was his, his um, sister, which of course she was, but she was also his wife. And he did it protect himself because she was a beautiful woman. He thought the king might kill him to take um, his wife. And so to protect himself, he lies. A blatant, outright lie. And this is something that happened with the Jewish people a lot. And so you can see this is another example. There was a lot of refinement God's going to have to do with this guy's character before he's going to be king. Um, you know, this is not the, the David people grew up learning about. It's not the David that you read about in the Psalms. But nonetheless, this was part of the real David's life, things that had to be dealt with before God could inaugurate him as king of his people. So going on to chapter 28, <clears throat> now I don't know what to do with this chapter, and I'm not alone. I'm in good company. It is fraught with difficulties, chapter 28 is. Um, I believe, however, that the truth is, is not seen so much in the narrative itself, but in understanding that each person in the narrative was being honest about what they experienced as an individual. That does not mean that their understanding of what they experienced was accurate. Okay? And that's an important stipulation. Here we have a woman in this chapter who is a necromancer, um, which is a practice God abhors and forbade. Uh, to King Saul's credit, he had driven out all divination from the land. But when he could get no answers... Um, um, uh, from God in any other way, he sought out one of the very same people he had sought to remove from Israel. So someone that practiced divination. Um, that God hates necromancy hints at the idea that there's at least part of necromancy that's real. It works. Otherwise, there seems little to hate, uh, but an empty practice. Um, other than the fact that it directs the heart to seek someone for answers and comfort other than God. Um, it can also be argued that it opens the door for demonic communication and communion as well as, um, as well. So there is that possibility as well. But God hated divination and necromancy, and that's who he wound up seeking. Um, at face value, this witch at Endor summons up the spirit of Samuel, who had already passed, the prophet Samuel, for Saul. If you remember Saul during his lifetime, if he had a question, he went to Samuel about it. And now Samuel's not around. And he already tried to, to contact and, and hear God's direction from other people, and it didn't work. God wasn't speaking to him, so he consulted this witch at Endor to summon up Samuel's spirit from the dead so he could inquire of him what he should do. Now, this spirit may have been an evil spirit, or no spirit at all, since only the witch saw her, uh, saw him, and that's admitted in the passage. However, there seemed to be at least some contact and communication with some spirit to this woman, since 
all that she said to Saul as a result of this divination came to pass. What she said came true. Now, this could be another case like Ahab, where a spirit came and spoke through this woman's mouth, and Samuel never actually appeared to her at all. Who knows? In the end, the results are the same. It was a prophetic word that Saul would die, and he did. Now, some take exception with the notion that Samuel was disturbed and that he rose from the grave rather than descended from heaven. That's if you're reading commentators and say, you know, because this whole passage makes it sound like Samuel actually did rise, not physically, but as a spirit, as an apparition. And that this woman spoke to him and gave Saul the words that Samuel spoke to her. And, and that may have happened. Um, but there are some commentators that will dismiss it out of hand simply because of the fact Samuel was disturbed and that he rose up rather than descended down from heaven. And to me, these are nonsensical issues. Um, there's no issue at all, really. The, the word disturbed could simply mean provoked, which is something that Saul did regularly with Samuel while he was alive, alive so why would it be any different now? Um, it could also mean just to rouse up as if out of slumber. This also might be appropriate. Um, that he rose rather than descended from heaven is not an issue, since until Jesus came and rescued all those in paradise, everyone who died that was righteous went into the heart of the earth in Abraham's bosom with a large ravine between they and the damned that were on the other side. Jesus described that in his ministry. And so, they, of course, he would have risen from up and from the, the ground, not descended from heaven. Nobody went to heaven at that point. So now one thing which implies that this woman at least thought she saw um, uh, the Samuel, who she was summoning, is that she was genuinely fri frightened at the, the, the appearance of the apparition, apparition. The scriptures are clear that she was she was scared. Um, the passage doesn't say that she saw an evil spirit who came bearing the image of Samuel, just that she saw Samuel. Um, but this is, the, you know, so, I mean, what I'm getting at is that she saw Samuel. Whether that means she actually saw Samuel or saw a spirit who looked like him, I don't know. It, does, it depends on whether it's being written from the perspective of the woman or the perspective of God from reality, what really happened. I don't know. So uh, one thing which seems to sway, swing contrary to this is, um, as a literal happening, is that it seems unlikely that the righteous dead could be within the power of an evil practice carried out by a wicked person. Uh, you know, that an evil person could summon a righteous spirit up from the grave. That seems a little bit beyond the pale for me. Um, but I'm not going to dismiss it out of hand just because I don't understand it. In the end, we never want to manipulate Scripture to fit within our own present paradigm. We need to be willing to include in the scope of possible meanings anything that doesn't in offer a clear and obvious breakaway from what Scripture says about a given topic. So uh, we'll just go on with the passage now, but I want to at least let you know there's different views as to what actually happened here. But in the end, what we do know is that everything that was said to Saul from this encounter with this necromancer, came true. So, starting in verse 1, it says, At that time the Philistines brought their military units together into one army to fight against Israel. So Achish said to David, You know, of course, that you and your men must march out in the army with me. David replied to Achish, Good, you will find out what your servant can do. So Achish said to David, Very well, I will appoint you as my permanent bodyguard. By this time Samuel had died, and all the Israel and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, um, his uh, um, his city. And Saul had re, uh, removed the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines came together and camped at Shunem. So Gal Saul gathered all Israel, and they camped at G uh, um, Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine camp, he was afraid and trembled violently. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him in the dreams, or by the Urim of the pro uh, by the Urim, or by the prophets. Saul then said to his servants, "Find me a woman who is a medium, so I can go out and consult her." His servants replied, "There is a woman at Endor who is a medium." 
Saul disguised himself by putting on different clothes and set out with two men of his uh, two of his men. They came to the woman at night, and Saul said, Consult a spirit for me. Bring up for me the one I tell you. But the woman said to him, You surely know what Saul has done, how he has killed the mediums and spiritualists in the land. Why are you setting a trap up uh, for me to get me killed? Then Saul swore to her by the Lord, I surely, I surely as the Lord lives, nothing bad will happen to you because of this. Who is it that you want me to bring up for you? The woman asked. Bring up Samuel for me. Um, uh, he said, when the woman saw Samuel, she screamed, and then she asked Saul, why did you deceive me? You are Saul. But the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? I see a spirit for a forthcoming up out of the earth. The woman answered. Then Saul asked her, what does he look like? He is an old, an old man is coming. She said, he's wearing a robe. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down his face to the ground and paid homage. Why have you disturbed by me by bringing me up? Samuel said to Saul. I'm in serious trouble, replied Saul. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He doesn't answer me any more, either through the prophets or in a dream, so I called to you to, uh, to tell me what I should do. Samuel answered, Since the Lord has turned away from you and has become your enemy, why are you asking me? The Lord has done exactly what he said through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. You did not obey the Lord and did not carry out his wrath against Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will also hand Israel over to the Philistines along with you. Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, and the Lord will hand Israel's army over to the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell flat on the ground. He was terrified by Samuel's words, and he was so weak because he hadn't had any food all day and all night. The woman came over to Saul, and she saw that he was terrified, and said to him, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me. Now please listen to your servant. Let me get you some food in front of you. Eat, eat, and it will give you strength so that you can go on your way. He refused, saying, I won't eat. But when his servants and the woman urged him, he listened to them, and he got up off the ground and sat on the bed, and the woman had the flat, a fattened calf at her house, and she quickly slaughtered it. She also took flour, kneaded it, baked unleavened bread. She served it to Saul and his servants, and they ate. Afterwards, they got up, and they left that night. Uh, left at night. <clears throat> that night, yeah, I'm sorry. Chapter 29, verse 1. The Philistines brought all their military units together at Aphek, while Israel was camped by the spring of Jezreel. As the Philistine leaders were passing in review of their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were passing in review behind them with Achish. Then the Philistine commanders asked, What are these Hebrews doing here? Achish answered the Philistine commanders, That is David, servant of King Saul of Israel. He has been with me a considerable, considerable period of time. From the day that he affected until today, I found no fault with him. The Philistine commanders, however, were enraged with Agish and told him, Send that man back and let him return to the place you assigned him. He must not go down with us into battle, only to become our adversary, turning, uh, turning against us during the battle. What better way could he regain his master's favor than with the heads of our men? Isn't this the David they sing about during their dances? Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands? So Achish summoned David and told him, As the Lord lives, you are an honorable man. I think it is good to have you working with me in the camp, because I have found no fault in you from the day that you came to me until today. Well, it's good. It's only and the only reason why we know is because David killed all the people that could have told him, right? But the leaders didn't think you are reliable. So now go back quietly, and you won't be doing anything the Philistine leaders think is wrong. But what have I done? David replied to Achish. From the day, first day I was with you until today, what have you found against your servant to keep me from going along to fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Achish answered David, I am convinced that you are as reliable as an angel of God, but the Philistine commanders have said he must not go into battle with us. So get up early in the morning, you and your man's, uh, your, your, your master's servants who came with you. When you've gotten, when you've all gotten up early, go as soon as it's light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now, this is an, uh, another difficult passage, because David here 
seems all but eager to prove his loyalty to this pagan king by going to war against his own people. However, the situation bore out a solution which not only kept David back from such an egregious sin, but also placed him back in communion with God once more, as we will see, um, resulted, and it resulted um, from, it was a result from this refusal to allow him to go to war against his own people. God was able to turn his heart back around. And that will be in the next chapter, which we will pick up with next month, well, with next week. But anyway, these three chapters are, are pretty simple chapters. Again, you have Saul attacking David, David, um, you know, having a chance to kill him and deciding not to, and uh, and Saul admitting that he's wrong and that David's right. Then, uh, you know, David walking away, even though he didn't have a problem, you know, he walked away safe. He decided, you know what, eventually Saul's going to kill me, so I'm going to protect myself and became aligned with the Philistines. And uh, then the Philistines decided to go, I mean, then David winds up killing a bunch of people uh, while he's living uh, under the king's jurisdiction, claiming they're his people, though they weren't. And then eventually the Philistines decide to mount war against Israel. David was going to go with them, and then he's not allowed to go because the leaders of the Philistines wouldn't let him go. But that same warning got to Saul, and he was worried, and that's why he contacted um, uh, this this medium. He tried to hear from a prophet and from the Urim and Thurim, but, uh, Thummim, but he couldn't hear, so he went to um, a, a necromancer to talk to Samuel. Um, and the reason why Saul was probably scared, because he knew not just the Philistines were going to come against him, but David was with the Philistines. And so he was scared for his life. Um, uh, in the end, though, David did not want going to battle. God was able to turn his heart around as a direct result of having been forbade going into battle with the Philistines. When he went back to Ziklag is when God was able to get a hold of him. So we'll pick up with that next week. I guess that's it. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? I've you know what crossed my mind, Mark, was do you think that David in going with the Philistines against Saul that he would have killed him if he had the opportunity? I don't think that David would have killed Saul, even in a battle like that, because he'd made up his mind uh, that he was God's anointed. He was actually, David was actually scared to, in some respects, even though he, it was kind of didn't make any sense, because even though he knew God had delivered Saul into his hands, and he acknowledged that, he still felt like it would be sin to kill him. So it doesn't make sense, you know, but David seemed to be pretty well convinced of it. So no, I don't think he would have. I think what, I think what may have happened is I think David would have made up made up his mind if he went into to battle, he probably would have turned against the Philistines and fought for Israel. Um, because even when he lied to the king and said he was going to, he went, he'd been going on raids to, to hurt Israelites, he didn't. Which tells me it wasn't in his heart to hurt his own people. So chances are, if he'd gone into battle, he would have turned on the Philistines. Um but we just don't know. There's no way to know because it's silent on that and it didn't happen. So, but it's a good question. Could, could you, okay, if it was not the Israelite David claimed to have killed, but he actually did kill people, who were they? Well, it gave us a list of the people. They were, um, uh, they were all people from, uh, like the south country of the Jera uh, uh, Melites, um, that was in the south country of, of Judah. He went against the Kenites and um, I think one other group. I forget what the name of the other one was. But it tells us in the group, it tells us in that list who it is that he came against. None of them were the people of Israel. So, um, okay. so yeah, he fought against other people but claimed he had killed Israelites. But again, that's why he killed everybody is so that the people he killed if there were remainders, people who were still alive, they would have informed the king that, you know, David lied. And he didn't. They, they, there wasn't any left around to, to tell on him. So it was a pretty horrible thing for him to do. Uh, and again, it was all to protect himself. Uh, it's the lesson that we have to learn is that when we begin to protect ourselves, uh, whenever that happens, eventually you wind up having to create more problems and more deceptions to continue to protect yourself, um, and eventually either you're going to have to repent or it's going to lead to your own destruction. 
um, that's just the way things work, especially for someone who's God's child. Because they won't let them, he won't let them get away with it. Not indefinitely. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, um, well then we're going to finish up the book of Samuel, uh, first Samuel next week. And we will introduce where we're going to at the end of that. So that will take up another session. So uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Great. Grace. Grace. Grace.